Hi, I'm Scott Hamilton, Rockfile, back with another podcast review for your ears. Going to be talking about the 1985 movie legend, The Director's Cut. So this is the first podcast I'm recording in a new professional studio. I have a new gig and and I'm working in a radio station. We actually have five studios and I thought I would, you know, try and do a podcast in here and see how that went. So uh, we're talking about Legend. This was the uh, 1985 film starring Tom Cruise, Mia Serra, Tim Curry, and directed by the one and only Ridley Scott. Now, he was coming off Alien and some other things. He was a hot director at the time. This movie had like a $24 million budget and went down as kind of a failure. It only made about $23 million at the box office. But it's become quite the cult classic on uh, home video. And years ago, they found a director's cut. And when they released it on Blu-ray back in about 2007, they restored the longer director's cut. Now, the U.S. version was about 89 minutes as it played here in the United States, and the director's cut is almost two hours. So there's quite a bit of other stuff in the movie. And I had watched it several years ago, but to be perfectly honest with you, I looked at the disc in my collection and went, I don't even remember what was different about the director's cut. Let me watch that tonight instead of, I was actually going to watch the theatrical version, which I'm going to watch soon it's finally getting a 4k release so i was re-watching the director's cut to re-familiarize myself with it and and do a review for this podcast and the short version is skip this and watch a the theatrical version unless you just absolutely love the theatrical version and want to know more it is a different movie it has a different soundtrack it has the original orchestral soundtrack not the cool one that he added later from tangerine dream um, and that gives it kind of a Disney feel. Also, Mia Sarah has some singing parts. There's actually uh, some musical stuff at the beginning of the movie. And it, it, it really it stands out in stark contrast to the, the theatrical version. I am usually someone who likes a, th- a director's cut, that, that they put some more stuff in or they, or they did it a little differently. I usually like that. This was actually a little bit hard to sit through because Legend has always been one of my favorite movies. It's... Probably not one of Tom Cruise's favorite because he has very few speaking parts. He plays this this child of the forest who really, you know, he's not real smart and uh, he's just acrobatic and really acrobatic, actually. And there's a lot more of that in, in the director's cut. Um, the change in music was the biggest thing that just gives the whole movie a different feel. Some things are moved around a little bit. Um, but overall, I just thought the director's cut was okay. I, I think... To me, it it feels like this was what he turned in, and they went, well, could we do a little better? And completely getting rid of this, I believe it was James Horner who did the soundtrack. And it's a really, you know, for any other normal fantasy-type film, it would have been the perfect soundtrack. But after seeing this for so many years with the Tangerine Dream soundtrack, I can't watch it any other way. It just felt out of place. It felt like a completely different movie. Mia Sarah has some different parts. Tom Cruise has a little bit different parts. Uh, Tim Curry has quite a few different lines and parts in the movie. Again, there's almost 30 extra minutes, 24 extra minutes in this version of the film. So there is a lot of other stuff. A lot of it could be cut out and you don't miss anything. But I did like it, it, it made the darkness character a little bit more sinister. Another thing I noticed for an early PG-13 movie, um, it's pretty brutal what's going on in the background sometimes. When they finally get into Darkness's lair, Darkness is the name of that Tom, Tim Curry devilish character, um, or son of the devil, if you want to read into what's going on in the film. Um, they're hacking up a body in the background where the guys are being held um, and chopping them up. And you don't get to see the actual chopping, but he comes down with a meat cleaver on a guy and the guy wails in pain and moves around on the table. And they show up more than once. And I'm just like, wow, that was that, this is a lot darker than I remembered it being. Um, but the director's cut, I, I will do a second podcast review of the theatrical version when I get to it in the next couple of weeks. But the director's cut, it just, like I said, the music kind of almost plays against it knowing what I know. It, had I seen this the first time through this way, I would have probably been more accepting of the music. It just, it it does give the movie a completely different feel, an almost Disney-esque feel, which makes it really weird when it gets into the real dark and scary stuff. And that being said, that part of the movie, most of the stuff towards the end stays the same on how they defeat darkness and how they go about that and, and how the elves and everybody helps and 
I don't know. I, I just it, the 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 longer version feels a little disjointed, a little loose. Um, but yet some of it seems more streamlined. Like we go from point A to point B to point C a lot easier. The the shorter version, the theatrical version, is a more surreal. Um, and that's not just the music, but the way the film was cut. It's just a more surreal version of the film. This was more like the standard had somebody other than Ridley Scott directed it. This is probably how it would have come out. One thing I really like about Legend still to this day, all these years later, the practical effects. There was no CGI at the time. So other than a few composited things, it's it's all done in camera with makeup effects. The witch in the, in the, uh, the swamp scene, amazing. And it turns out she was uh, Robert Picardo from Star Trek and Stargate. Um, and what he does an amazing job in that small role. Um, all of the elves and, and the little people, I, I just thought they were all fantastic. The voiceovers are great. The makeup effects on everybody. Um, nobody's wearing a full suit or mask. They've got ears or noses or eyebrows or whatever. I just, that part of the movie, I mean, this was made 25 years before the Lord of the Rings movies came out. And so much time and attention and detail. The movie was filmed on a soundstage that they made to look like outdoors. <laughs> and with everything, blowing leaves and stuff in the wind and, and horses with horns, unicorns. But they actually put horns on real horses and had them ride through. And it cuts to some scenes that were actually shot outdoors. And it fits very well. It, it all fits in very, very well with what they've created on the soundstage. And there's actually a, a lake, a river on the soundstage that, that Tom Cruise had to dive into and it freezes over at one point. It, the amount of, of detail they went into for $24 million back in 1985 is amazing that these days they would take a shortcut and do a CGI or what they're doing on the Mandalorian show with, you know, kind of only a little bit of the foreground is, is real and the rest of it's done on the screens behind you. Um, it's actually amazing to watch, and I can't wait to watch the theatrical version. But again, if you're planning to sit down and watch the the director's cut, only if you're a huge fan, because I found that the theatrical version was a much easier, more fun watch. But it, it stands, the director's cut stands apart as something like, this is what could have been that wasn't, but you can get it now, and it's good quality on the Blu-ray. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the 4K release that's coming very soon from Arrow. So... Uh, my take on it, I still love the theatrical version. The director's cut, mm, it's it's an oddity that should only be watched by true fans. I'm Scott Hamilton, Rockfile. My website is therockfile.com. Please check it out for links to my other projects. I'm now broadcasting live from Alaska, so I'll give you some details on that as we go forward because I've got a really long podcast coming up about my epic journey to get here from South Florida to Kenai, Alaska. It was supposed to be five to six days, and it took eight and I'll give you all that in a podcast coming up. In the meantime, thank you so much for liking, sharing, subscribing, and listening. I wouldn't be here without you.